Let's begin our time together with a prayer. Heavenly Father, you've blessed our study all the weeks along that we've traveled through the book of Zechariah. We ask that you bless our study this day. Open our hearts and minds to learn the truths that you present in these visions and help us to see how these truths guide us in our lives. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Welcome. This is our final week of our study um, of the eight night visions of Zechariah. I probably need to announce, I know some of you have asked me, the, the videos of this class are already posted online. They're on the website, the Mount Olive website under the Bible class section, videos for every week. So today's video, we're filming it as we do every week. It'll be posted probably within two or three days. By next Monday for sure, Mr. Liebhardt puts them up. And so all eight videos are there and you can do any review that you need or share the idea with other people who might be interested. Um, this final class focuses on the final visions in the book of, uh, or in the, of the eight night visions of Zechariah. And here it's most important to see the arrangement that we followed all along, to follow the, the, the pattern that God shows us, the, the, the pattern where he moves from outside to inside and then back out again, connects the visions one with another, and teaches truths that guide us in our lives. What we should do though, is make sure that we're gathering these truths and collecting them in our minds, and so a little Spiritual review is always in order this time of morning. That's why I'm glad we start early, so your minds are fresh. What we're going to do is review the, the truths we found so far, the spiritual principles that God revealed in each of the visions, just to see how many we remember. First principle was revealed in the vision of the man and the horses among the myrtle trees. Remember that, myth, that vision? The Lord is watching. There it is. She's got it. The Lord is watching. <laughs> God's paying attention. He's not ignoring our world. He's not uninvolved. He's paying close attention to what's happening every day. That's the first spiritual truth. Then we saw the vision of the four craftsmen. Remember, there were four horns. That's the nations that scattered Judah. That was Babylon and Assyria. And then there's four craftsmen. God says these carpenters are going to come down and throw down the horns. And that craftsman, of course, represented Persia. So this is the picture. What's the spiritual truth? God's watching. What's the second truth? God's acting. He's involved in our world right now. When you watch all the events that are happening in our world today, they seem so chaotic and so out of control and so unpredictable. War in the Ukraine, war in the Sudan, an economy out of, out of sorts in our country, uh, politicians fighting about whether to pay debts or not. It's the, it's the most scary thing to see until you realize in all of this, God is acting. All of it is under his control. All of it is infused into his plan to carry out in this world, and that's what he shows here under Zechariah's vision and what he wants us to know today. Questions or comments before we move on? Next vision, man with a measuring rod. He came with a measuring rod. He's preparing to do construction. He measures Jerusalem. And then suddenly an angel comes and says, don't bother to measure Jerusalem. It's going to be so big and so filled with prosperity you can't measure it. And what's the spiritual truth that lies within it? The Lord is turning ruin into blessings. The Lord can turn ruin into blessings. That's exactly right. The idea is that this Lord on a national level can take care of his own, even if it seems the problems are insurmountable. No matter what they are, war and economic collapse and anything else you can imagine, don't worry. The Lord's not only here for you, the Lord's going to turn this ruin into a blessing so you never have reason to be afraid. Ever wonder how many times the Bible uses the term, don't be afraid? Every time somebody appears from the Lord as a representative, the first step, don't be afraid. Jesus said it after the resurrection, don't be afraid. That's what God wants you to know. He's here. Every single issue is under his control, and he'll turn every bit of that into a blessing, and you can count on it. In fact, the Bible even recommends that we should glory in our tribulations. Rejoice in them, because you know I can't wait to see how this becomes a blessing. That's how God speaks and how he works in our lives. And the vision here, the vision of the man, the measuring rod, shows us that. So promise blessings from ruin. That we can count on no matter what we're facing, either on a national level or even in our personal lives. The next vision, the vision of Joshua before the throne of God. Remember here that the Israelites in captivity came back from captivity fully understanding the history. God sent them into captivity because they sinned. They wouldn't listen to him. Now they're coming back from captivity, and God announces, oh, you're going to have all this blessing. And they're thinking, I'm not sure I can trust that. I'm the same as I always was. 
We're still sinful. We're still not what we should be. How can God possibly bless us? So God gives him this next vision, the vision of Joshua before the throne of God. This is the high priest Joshua, remember? He's standing in front of the throne of God. He's dressed in dirty clothes. And next to him is Satan himself accusing him of sin. And the Lord rebukes Satan and said, don't you accuse what I've, what I've snatched from the fire. What's the message? The spiritual message? What's the principle involved here? Grace. The grace of God. We call it the grace principle. How can God forgive people who don't deserve it? Grace. He loves you when you don't deserve it. He takes your sin away in one day's time. That's his prediction. Already looking ahead to Good Friday in this, this vision. God himself is going to bless you and love you even if you don't deserve it and make your clothes clean even though you've made them dirty. That's the promise here. And by the way, notice that this is the foundation principle. God says, I'm watching. And the question is, why? God says, I'm acting. The question is, why? What are you trying to do? God says, I'll turn your blessing into ruin. How could you do that, Lord? Why? The answer, grace. God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You want to know what's happening in this world right now? You're not going to learn it on the pages of the front pages of our newspaper or on the TV news at night. Well, they'll tell you all kinds of stuff. There's war in Ukraine. There's this disaster happened over here. There's a big storm in Guam. On and on and on. But they won't tell you God's acting to share his life with as many people in darkness as he can. And that's the only important thing that's happening. Everything depends on that. That's what's really going on. That's why the world exists today. That's why everything's happening. Everything plays a part in that plan. The grace principle. Comments, thoughts, questions. Remember, on a personal level, your own life plays a part in that plan. Everything that happens to you today, part of that plan. Every moment you have of opportunity. When you go to the grocery store and have to stand in line, there's 12 people ahead of you. Opportunity. Who are these people? Take a look at them. Is there a chance here to show them some of the hope that you have? That's your moment. Your, your family, interacting with them, your people at work, your grandchildren, whatever. Any touch you get is part of that grace principle in action. You get to play a role. That's why God gave you today. It's the way you can tell a good day from a bad day. The more you can act in this day in the grace principle, share that hope, the better that day gets for you and the more purposeful that day is. Worst kind of day you can spend is day looking out the window with nothing to do. Pick up the phone or whatever else you have to do to contact those you love. Comments, questions? Grace principle. Next it moved into the, the vision of the lampstand and the olive trees. We spend lots of time with this one. God is showing how that grace principle then is amplified in our own lives and how it worked, first of all, Zechariah, how it works for us as well. We have some discussion of what this means, but the principle, the message of Zechariah is the center of it. He came to Zerubbabel and he said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What's the principle? If you're going to live in grace and share that grace, even though you don't have any skill and you don't have enough of what it takes, what does God tell you? Trust in the Lord and you will succeed. Trust in the Lord and you will succeed. It's about the Lord and His strength. It's not about yours. You know, they sent me out in, in, uh, to be a missionary in Rhode Island when I left uh, the, the seminary. And there was just one problem. I had never actually made a missionary call on anybody in my whole life. They said, go to Rhode Island, do that. And that was it. And I said, yes, who <laughs> knew? Went there, and I knocked on doors every day, all day long. That's what you do. All day long. Because I didn't have it. I get two people in my congregation. I'm starting a church. So I'm knocking on doors. Strangers at every door. Slamming the door in the face. And my knees knocking on every doorstep with the same question. What do I say? How do I say it? They just slam the door. This is my fault. What can I do with the next door? Should I even see the next door? Lots of challenges. At any rate, God answers every frightened Christian in the same exact way he answered me. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Think about people who need to hear about the hope you have, and yet you're afraid to go to them. You're afraid because you don't have the words. You're afraid because you don't know what to say. You don't know how to do this. God says, it's not about you. The Holy Spirit will help you. Just go. Say what you know. 
Witness to what you've experienced. The Lord will take care of it. This is the principle that we're seeing here in action on that ground level. Comments or questions or thoughts? Next principle. The curses of the flying scroll. Now please notice that these, these um, visions are connected. There's always two visions at each level. So vision one and vision eight are together. Vision two and vision seven are together. That's what you see here. Um, and vision three and vision six are together and four and five are together. That's what we're talking about. So you're looking here at the sixth principle, the sixth vision, the curses on the flying scroll, and that goes with the promised blessings. Those two work together to create one message at that level. The message initially was promise in the midst of ruin. Good. But then the Israelites had a question. What about sin? It's still here. I'm still a sinner. We've been through this with the grace thing. And what does God say? He shows a flying scroll with curses on it. It's so big you can't miss it. On one side, it curses those who steal. On the other side, it curses those who lie. What's the spiritual principle that's now possible because of grace in your life? <coughs> Repentance. Repentance is possible. The concept, you're free to remove willful sin from your life. God has equipped you through the grace principle to do battle with sin. And conversely, all that prosperity God promises, if you don't do battle with the sin now, the willful sin in your life, it threatens that prosperity. They're related. It's all part of God's plan for you. He put faith in you for a reason. Remember the parable of the tree that God planted? Planted the tree, worked for three years, tended around it, nothing grew. Uh, the, the owner of the vineyard came along and said, the tree's producing nothing, cut it down. And then the guy says, no, give it another year, let me tend it a little more, and then maybe it'll produce fruit. God's looking for fruit in each one of us because he's put that faith in our hearts. He's equipped us to deal with sin in our life, to put it aside, willful sin. We are now not what we once were. We're a new creation, and we, therefore, can do battle with that every day. Doesn't mean you always win. Doesn't mean it ever go away. But it means you're equipped now. Equipped to live in this world and serve this God by His grace because of the faith He put in your heart. Questions, reactions, thoughts? One more to go. The woman in the basket. Another vision. Sees a woman. Remember what he called her? He said, this woman in the basket is what? Evil. Evil. And he pushes her down in the basket and two angels come along, two women, pick her up and fly her to Babylon where evil will be settled. This is God working at that outside level. When the Lord is acting, remember that, that passage, the Lord is acting was that principle? This is the one that matches that. What God is saying, yes, I'm acting, and here's my purpose. My purpose is to gather evil in one place and then to deal with it. So he gathers it in Babylon and deals with it, sent the Persians to deal with them. He's still doing that today. You think the Ukraine is an accident? You think the evil woman in the basket hasn't been dropped over there? You think the Sudan is an accident? That it, it's happened for no reason? God gathers together the evil, places it in one place in the world, and deals with it for all of us to see. The news never announces that. When they talk about the Sudan, it's, oh, the poor people that aren't eating. Oh, the poor people don't have any water. Oh, the poor people that need our help come give to them. That's their message, and that's what they get out of it. But never will they say, that's a place of evil. And the Lord is acting, and we all better repent before the Lord comes with the great judgment. That's what's happening on this level. God's gathering evil together, and God's dealing with it. The Lord gathers sin to pour out his wrath on it, and we all will watch that and see it on our TVs every night. These are the principles we've learned so far. Reactions, thoughts, questions. All right, well, let's get going then, because now God's going to put it all together. Remember, we're following a chiastic arrangement, which we've been talking about. Circle 1 includes vision 1 and vision 8. That's the outside layer, the furthest one that God talks about. Then one step in is the international layer, visions 2 and vision 7 we saw. Circle 3 is the level inside of that, the national level, visions 3 and 6. And then circle 4, the local layer, 4 and 5 go together. What we're going to do now is put the last vision in place, which is the outside circle. This is the vision that matches vision number one, the Lord is watching. Here God completes that vision and shows you what he's going to accomplish. And it's the most amazing thing. It's what we call the vision of the four chariots. Now there's three parts to this. Vision, the first part is the vision appears, verses one to four. 
Then the messenger, that's Jesus, explains the vision, that's 5 and 6, and then finally the vision continues in verses 6 or 7 and 8. Here it begins. I look up again, and there before me were four chariots coming out from heaven, or coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, the fourth dappled, and all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my lord? Zechariah is perpetually confused, just as perhaps some of us feel when we see these visions for the first time. What's going on, Lord? I don't understand. Now, notice, here's a question. The two mountains were mountains of bronze, and the chariots came out from between them. That's important. Here's the question. Question number one on your worksheet. How do the two mountains of bronze remind the Jews of the Temple of Solomon before it was destroyed? Well, there was a lot of bronze used in making the, the I don't know what they call it, the, like the bath. They used bronze to make the sea. That's true. The sea was a place where the, where the uh, priests washed with them prepared the sacrifices. That's true. But this is something a little different in that same temple, although you're on the right track. Two mountains of bronze, the chariots come out from between them, a reminder for the Jewish exile of Solomon's temple. Ha! Got to know just a shade bit about the temple that Solomon built. Yes, sir? Weren't there two bronze pillars on the side? Al says, I'm thinking now, weren't there two bronze pillars right in front of the temple? They even named them, Boaz and Jacob. They put them right up there, they're huge, and they stood right in front of the doors of the temple. Bronze, made of bronze, pure bronze with a capital on top that's highly described and decorative. Anyhow, when the Jews hear about these two mountains of bronze with the chariots coming out between them, they're thinking, that's like Solomon's temple. And the chariots are coming out from between the two bronze pillars out into the world as the Lord sends them. That's the image you have to keep in your mind because that's the image the exiles had. This is God sending his chariots out from the temple area through the mountains of bronze out into the world. <clears throat> Question so far? You're with the picture. Now you're right where the exile stood. Next part of the picture, the angel explains. The angel answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. The one with the black horses is going toward the north country. The one with the white horses toward the west and the one with the dappled horses to the south. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth, and he said, go throughout the earth, and so they went throughout the earth. That's the image. Remember in the first vision, where the apple horses went, or the horses of all colors went throughout the world and came back with a report? This is a match of that. Same activity. Horses and chariots coming out from the mountains of bronze, straining to go out into the world. That's the picture. A couple of questions. First of all, number two, who sends the horses out into the world in this vision? Who sent them? What's that? God did. They come out from the presence of the Lord. The Lord is sending the horses out. Still in charge, still watching, still active in the world. Okay? So the Lord sends them. By the way, that was the easiest question you're going to get to me. As an example, try this one. Number three. Why are there only three directions mentioned? And how do these directions offer comfort to the exile? It says one went north, one went south, one went west. How come no east? Why three directions? How is that a comfort? Let's start with geography, just so you know. If you are in Jerusalem, why wouldn't you go east to travel? Mediterranean. Into the Mediterranean. Well, Mediterranean would be west. You have to go the other way. That's what I say to my wife, the other east. You're right, the other east. <laughs> right the desert. Desert. Tons of desert. You've, if you're familiar with uh, the Middle East topography, you know that they have what's called the Fertile Crescent. Perhaps you've heard of that. The Jewish people were here along the Mediterranean Sea. Then there's a crescent, a fertile crescent, that curves around all the way to Iraq and Iran. It's green, it's water, it's got the Tigris River, Euphrates River in there, and lots of, lots of uh, growth and, and lots of civilization possible. But right under this fertile crescent, right here, is a bunch of desert. Can't live there, can't travel there, nobody goes there. They always went around the fertile crescent to travel. So, no east was normal for the Jews. They would say, of course, you go east, that doesn't bother us at all. But why north 
Why south? Why west? And how is that a comfort? Is that where what? Is that where they, all these horses just came from, was east? All the horses came oh, from the temple. Okay, but was that the east? Was that the east? No. Okay. That's the center. Now we have four directions going off from that. One was desert, so they don't go. What you got, Al? So, south would be Egypt. Um, east would be Assyria. West? Or no, west. north is where we are. South is, e South is Egypt. Yeah. What's north? Babylon. Babylon. What's west? Greece. Louder, please. Greece and Rome. Greece. Greece is west. What we're talking about is the directions where the ruling powers were existing. God sends a chariot to the north to deal with Babylon. God sends a chariot to the south to deal with Egypt. God sends a chariot to the west to deal with Greece. They're all world powers, and the Lord sends his chariots to deal with them. And what's the comfort for the exiles? In a world where they can't do anything, where they have no power, where they're not even considered a player, where they suffer at the hands of these world powers, their God is dealing with these enemies. God's sending his chariots out to them. That he's doing that, and we can trust God to know what he's doing. That's the picture. Comments or questions so far? So there's Chariots going in three directions, and the directions happen to be where these enemy nations lie, and the Lord sending the chariots out from the temple, out from the mountains of bronze, going out in those directions. God has a purpose and a plan. He's carrying it out. Mark, you have questions? The purpose of the red horses, then. Until we come to that. <laughs> You're asking about the purpose of the red horses? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> I hate saying that. <laughs> No, if, our rule would be if God doesn't define the color and give it value, then it's just a color, meant to color the picture. When God defines something, we fix on it and, and use that definition. When he doesn't, we try not to use our imagination to stick something in there, because usually we're not helping God out when we do that. So the general rule is if God didn't define the red horses more specifically than their color or tell us any more about it, we assume they have no other purpose in the picture than to be a color. Um, that's our best approach. Now, you'll find people that will guess, lots of books about that, but none of them that come saying God says. They're just giving what they say. All right, here we go. We are moving on with the vision as the vision now completes itself. Vision verse 6, verse 8, Then he called to me, Look, those going toward the north country have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. Do you remember what the horses reported in the first vision when they came back? What was their report? What's that? The world was peaceful. The world's at peace. Was that good news or bad news? In the first vision, was it good news or bad news? It's bad news. These were the enemies. They had scattered the Israelites. They had conquered them and caused them great misery. So God's people were miserable, and all the enemies that conquered them, they were at peace. They were living the good life. They had success wherever they went. That was the report. And remember, God reacted by saying, I'm going to fix that. I'll deal with these enemies. That was the first vision. Now, in this vision, the horses go to the north, it says, for example, as an example of what they're accomplishing. And what they accomplish? Rest in the land of the north. Peace. So the question. This is number four. Compare the message of peace in the world, which the horses delivered to God in the first vision, with the message of peace in the north country announced by the messenger in this vision. What's the difference in the message of peace? Yes, ma'am. Take a stab. Is it because the, the Jewish people or the Israelites now they were at peace? Again, please. Were they at peace, the Jewish the Israelite people now they were at peace, whereas the other first vision, Babylon was at peace, mm -hmm. right? So now in this vision, are his people at peace? So in the first vision, Babylon is at peace, and that was a bad thing, because the Jewish people were troubled. Now, what she's asking is, is this, is this a reverse of that, where the Israelites are at peace, and Babylon is not? It isn't really talking about the Israelites here, and what happens to them. It's talking about the horses accomplish 
in the land of the, of the north. What they accomplish is peace. God didn't want peace in the first time. Now God's accomplishing it. How is it different? The first peace versus the second. Second peace, Israel is at peace. Yes, Israel's at peace. But yeah, they were, uh, Israel was at peace and Babylon wasn't. It was just totally right. flipped from, from the first. Uh, that's what Debbie said too. You're connecting <laughs> those two, but not defining the two pieces. Peace in the first vision, peace in the second vision. What's the peace? Christ. Christ is the peace in the second vision. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. May the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace that he's talking about is the peace that Christ gives in this vision. So what's God saying? My horse chariots will go forth to the north and the south and the west, and they will accomplish peace. What's the message? What's he talking about? Scatter the word. Go out and tell the, tell the world. Tell the world the gospel, and the result will be the grace principle will accomplish its purpose. God will touch the hearts even in the lands of these people, these enemies of God, and his peace will be established there. He's talking about spreading that peace, that grace principle to the world through his chariots, leaving the temple that they're building. And he's talking about accomplishing that. Yours is what's going to be accomplished through the work you're doing here in building that temple. Through the two mountains, the chariots will go out into these terrible, savage countries and will accomplish my peace even there. The peace which passes all the human understanding, the peace that God gives, the gospel message. That's what he's describing here. Reactions, thoughts, comments. Wasn't the first peace when going to the north, Asia Minor was basically the north, the, would be the north portion. And where was the first place that, it, that it, uh, the gospel went with? It was with uh, St. Paul going to Asia Minor. So Dennis is asking a geographic question about what is actually north and did that include Asia Minor. Technically, if you look at your map, Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey. Yeah. So you're going a little bit left instead of north. You're, you're veering to the west. Whereas if you went to Babylon, you're north, veering to the north. It's Babylon he's talking about, not Asia Minor. Although the west, Greece is over there and Greece conquered Turkey and came in. Eventually deals with them, but that's not in the picture of the north necessarily. <coughs> I don't know if there's a relationship or not, I guess, is your question. You asked if Paul's, if Paul's ministry was a fulfillment of that. That was the first, that was the first uh, mission. Paul's mission, yes, he went first to there. That's true. I'm not so sure you could take that, put it into Zachariah's vision, and say that's the same thing, uh, land of the north. Um, you're kind of stretching. No one can say you're wrong because no one can say you're right, but <laughs> it's, a, it's one of those things. It's nice speculation. Um, let's move on then. We now get into what's called the last oracle. We've now seen in the, in the final vision that God is predicting success. Success for his plan, the grace plan. I'm showing you my horses and chariots will ultimately come out from between the mountains of this temple and accomplish my peace throughout the world. Even among the most unlikely places, you can count on that. So it's really a picture of the New Testament as well and of the spread of the gospel. But to explain all that and connect it together precisely, God finishes the night visions with what's called the final crowning oracle. That's located in Zechariah 9, verse 6, verses 9 to 15. We finish, focus our attention, therefore, on the first verses of that. The word of the Lord came to me. Take the silver and gold from the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, gold the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and the gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat. Hmm. So, people come to the exiles. From where? From Babylon. More exiles. More exiles travel from Babylon to the exiles in Jerusalem. And they bring with them gold and silver, right? It says, new exiles come. What do they bring with them? What's the messenger command Zechariah to do? What do they bring with them, these exiles? Lots of gold, lots of silver. What does the Lord tell Zechariah to do? Make a crown. And what, do what with the crown? Put it on the head of Joshua the high priest. Remember where God 
replace the dirty turban with a clean turban. Um, or Zechariah commanded her, and they did so to show that this is now chosen again. This is another act along the same line. I'm going to establish my people again. Their high priest will be respected before my throne. Put a crown on his head to demonstrate that. That's what's going on here. That's the picture, okay? But it's more than that. This is the really neat part. Zechariah 6, verses 12 and 13. Tell him, Joshua, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord, and it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two. When we get all of this and understand it, we can go home, just so you know what's ahead. Okay? Here's the first question. Note the word for crown in verse 11. It's actually a plural. Crowns. Zechariah envisions two crowns, not one. While the first crown is for the high priest Joshua, for whom is the second crown intended, according to the verses 12 and 13. If Joshua gets the first crown, who's supposed to wear the second crown? According to the verse. What? The branch, whom you're jumping way ahead because you guys like to read the book, it's, John, it's Jesus, is talking about the branch. The branch is the, the one who wears the ultimate crown. That's what's pictured here. Two crowns, one for the high priest now, God's accepted his people again, and one for the coming branch. He will wear this, and he's going to be special. Lots of characteristics that describe him. Uh, question number seven lists the five characteristics by which the branch will be identified when he comes. So take a close look at verses 12 and 13. Identify five characteristics. I'll start you out. First one, Lord of hosts. here is the man. He's human. Okay? Watch for a man is coming. What else do we know about him? It says that his name is the branch. He will branch out from his place. And what's he going to do? Build the temple. He's going to build the temple of the Lord. Second characteristic. This branch is going to come, a man, and he's going to build the temple of the Lord, even as you're building one now. He's going to build the temple. And it says, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. And then what does it tell us about him once he's got the temple built? He'll be clothed in majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. So once he builds the temple, now he's going to rule from the throne. He has all power. And then it says, he will be a priest on the throne. He's not only ruling, but he's a priest. And then it says, there will be harmony between the two. Hmm, here's the question. I know you're wondering it. What two offices will the branch unite? Who are the two? Priest and king. Priest and king are the two. Who was priest in the days of Zechariah? You know this. Who was the priest in the days of Zechariah? Who they put the crown on? Joshua. Joshua. There you go. Who's the king in the days of Zechariah? Zerubbabel wasn't a king. He was related to David, but he wasn't a king. Who's the king? You're right. There wasn't one. See, that's what you just said there by saying nothing. There's no king yet. That really bothered the Jews. They said, where's there going to king? God's promise is a king and a throne will rule forever. There's no king. And there's this priest. These are two offices. They seem separate. But now he tells us the branch is going to come and he's going to unite the two. He's going to be king and he's going to be priest. And from our understanding, he's going to be prophet as well. Prophet, priest, and king all in one. United office to rule the kingdom of God which he himself will establish. That's the picture here. So we're talking about the fulfillment of God's plan. The horses and the chariots go forward into the world with the message of God, spreading the peace of God. And the peace they're spreading is this king is coming. This king is coming and he's going to be everything we need him to be. Prophet, priest, and king all in one. And he'll rule forever in the kingdom he creates. That's the picture Zechariah has seen in this final vision as the oracle explains it. 
Questions? Response? Yes, sir. Um, when it confuses. Okay. Keep what? when it confuses. What's confusing? You know, we've got 2029 20, cents now. Now we know. Right. Now we know. Did he know? Did who know? Did Zachariah know what was going on? <laughs> what he's asking is, all right, you can explain all this about the New Testament because we're actually living in it. Then we see the resurrection, we celebrate Easter every year, we know what happened, we got it. But what about poor Zechariah, he says. That poor guy didn't see any of that fulfilled. Does he even know what's going on even after Jesus tells him? That was your question, right? Oh, we're all done. <laughs> Never mind, I guess that's too early. <laughs> well, sometimes, I've heard the question many times, obviously, we wonder about it. The Old Testament believer versus the New Testament believer. The Old Testament believer knew the promise was coming and trusted in that and looked forward to it. Starting with Eve in the garden, remember her first words when, when a king was born? If you know the Hebrew, it doesn't do it well in the translation, but the Hebrew, it actually says, I've gotten a man, the Lord. She actually said that. She thought, oh, the promise is fulfilled. Here he is, Cain. Whoa, was she disappointed. From that time on, every Jewish woman looked forward to that promise being fulfilled in every new birth of a baby boy, waiting and waiting and waiting. That's what they knew, that's what they trusted in, that's what drove them. Is it the same as our position, knowing what happened? We would say, well, no, I'd rather know the whole thing, how it worked out, you know, how, who won in the end. <laughs> we want to know that, we call that better. But did they know and were they comforted by that faith, which is probably in the bottom of your question? It would seem from what we read in the Old Testament, that's true. That promise meant everything to them. The covenant God made with them meant everything to them. It was the center of their life. As it followed into the New Testament with Christians. So the answer is, I don't know and what Jack Ryan And the prophet's role was then to keep reminding these Jews. Yes, the prophets kept reminding the Jews. And remember what Jesus says about the prophets when he's talking to his disciples? That many prophets long to know what you know and see what you've seen and try to find out what you know. Look how blessed you are to know this when they just so much long to see it happen. So Jesus draws that comparison which you're pointing to. That's true. Okay, anything else? So now you've got the picture. This is what's happening. God who controls all things has got a plan. He's carrying it out. And this is what he tells the exiles. The exiles in the middle of that mess. Temple's still not done. The rooms are still upon them. There's all kinds of enemies on every side. The task appears impossible, and God reveals all of this to them. Not only the temple, but great things will happen from this temple. The whole world will be changed by what happens, and you'll see that God's plan will be accomplished for the whole world, and you're part of it by what you're doing right now. That's the picture. By the way, God can say the same thing here in Mount Olive. You come to church on a Sunday, it seems like a normal Sunday. Yeah, they have it every week. Listen to the sermon, go home. If you have a cup of coffee in the comments first, then you go home, go through another week, come back the next week, do it again. Doesn't seem all that special. Doesn't seem all that earth shattering. Doesn't seem all that amazing. Doesn't seem even related to what's happening out there in the world. We look like we're disconnected. What is God telling us in the visions? Same thing he told them. You're part of God's active plan. You're playing a role. You in this church together, you as an individual in your life, you're part of the plan. Carrying the gospel of peace into a world around you, touching lives with the hope that God gave you as that hope spreads. You're an instrument of God in his hands every day. And your collective instrument is a church. That gathering on Sunday morning is an amazing thing. You gather with your fellow Christians, all of your instruments, shining a light right out loud for all to see. It's amazing. And it happens every week, and it's part of God's ultimate plan to accomplish spreading his peace throughout the world. Reactions to that, thoughts, that's the connecting link. That's why this study is important. We move on. Question number nine. Based on the five characteristics described, who's the branch? And more importantly, what's the temple he will build? Now, we all know Christ is the branch. Gave that away before. What's the temple? He's the temple. Jesus said, he's the temple. Okay, but normally the Bible doesn't use that image to say Christ is the temple. He says, destroy this temple, I'll build it again in three days, refer to himself. That's true. But remember when they use the imagery in the New Testament, talking about a temple, what's your relationship to the temple? You're part of it. What are you? Tom? We're, um, we're supposed to be the holy priesthood. We're the priesthood. 
the holy nation, people of God, all that's true. The spiritual house. Elsewhere, in that same concept, uh, Paul calls us bricks in the house of God. You're a brick in the house of God right now. You too, then. Brick in the house of God. Part of the temple that God's building. You become part of the temple. The living church of God becomes the temple Christ is building. Builds it then, predicted it would happen, building it now, and you see it in action. Each one of you, a brick added to the temple of the Lord's building. When he works faith in your heart, he adds you to that building and then uses you to touch others who will become bricks in that building. That's the work of the Christ, building the temple every day, creating his church and growing his church through the spread of the gospel, spreading that peace, another image that he uses. Reactions are thoughts. The most important thing that's happening in the world right now, the only important thing, spreading that peace to hearts in darkness and showing them the light Christ created. You get to be part of that all your life, at whatever stage you're in. Now, sometimes people wonder, they reach a stage in their life where they say, oh, what good is it? Why am I still here? You hear that a lot in nursing homes. Why am I still here? What's the point of today? You know, even the grandkids don't call anymore. Why bother? That becomes what they say. God says, no. You're a brick in the house of the Lord. You have the light of the Lord himself. You have a hope nobody has. Every day, if you're in a nursing home and people come to tend you to do for you what you can't do for yourself, those people are in the darkness and you've got hope to give them. You can. And I went to nursing homes in the ministry. I had an old lady, 95 years old, something. And I, I started dealing with her as a shut-in for years. I first came to her. I remember one day she was living with her daughter in, in her daughter's house, an old lady, and her daughter gave her a gift of um, Bible tapes. Cassette tapes, those were cassettes by the way, remember those? Cassette tapes. And I said, oh, you must be overjoyed. And she was crying. She said, no, I'm not. I said, why are you crying? This is a wonderful gift. She says, I've looked little long enough to hear them all. <laughs> Four years later, she bent through three sets of tapes, okay? Now she's in a nursing home. And when she's playing them, they're so loud, I can hear them when I park the car in the parking lot. Oh, she's got her tapes on, okay? She's, her hair is gone, her eyes are gone, she can't get out of the chair, she's all bent over. I walk into the room and the first word she says to me every time I come, God is so good to me. Every time I come, I walk in there full of all kinds of grumpiness, you know. Oh, I got a car don't work, machine don't break, oh, the church is a problem, all these guys are yelling at me. I walk in there, she says, oh, God is so good to me. I'm thinking, thank you, God, you sent me here. And then that's what I'm learning. Every stage of life, every place you are, you get to share the hope you have all your life until God calls you home. You're part of that temple that Jesus is building. Reactions or thoughts or comments. Um, final thoughts in this now. He, he wraps this up, verses 14 and 15. The crown will be given to Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedediah, and Han, son of Zephaniah, as a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. Question number 10. Until the branch comes, what do the exiles do with the second crown? First crown they put on Joshua's head. What do they do with the second crown? In the temple. They put it in the temple. <coughs> as a memorial. Can you imagine? The Jews building that temple. They got a second crown they made, matched the first, and this one they place in the temple itself and display it there. Because the branch is coming. You ask, what was their faith and what did they know? They look at that crown and say, we know the branch is coming. We look forward to that day when the branch comes. And every day before that time, when they enter the temple and see that crown, they get a reminder. God's made a promise. The God who's running the show. He's going to send the branch. Look forward to that, because that's the moment in history when everything changes. Comments, reactions. Notice how God holds that promise right in front of their eyes. This is what's coming. Kind of like the Lord does for us when he says, I'm coming again. We look forward to that day. 
when the Lord himself will appear, the heavens will back like a scroll, and God will come with his angels for that day and welcome us into his throne in heaven. Similar thought. The branch is coming for them, the Lord is coming again for us. Same picture. Now, question 11. The oracle concludes with a picture that represents two time periods. What will the exile see happening as they continue to rebuild the temple? And what will this prove about Zechariah's message? First of all, according to this verse, what are the exiles going to see in their lifetime as they build that temple? Well, they see, it, they see what the vision is playing out. It's the structure is getting built. As they build the structure, what will happen according to the verse? What will they see? <coughs> to see it? or to help build it. More exiles will come and join their hands to yours in the task. It says, those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord. Are they the Gentiles? No, this is more exiles than Zechariah's day. This is not a prediction in the future at the moment. It's, remember, it's two time periods. First time period is in right now, Zechariah's time period. These are exiles. While you build this temple, it looks like you don't have enough help. Don't you worry. Those who are far away will come and help build the temple of the Lord. More hands are going to come. You'll find more join in you. You'll find growth here. You'll find the swell as we get this done and more people join in. And then, what does he say? You will know the Lord Almighty has sent me. When you see all this happening, when you see the temple rising from ruins as you're building it, when you see others joining you and saying, hey, let me help, then you're going to know all that I predicted wasn't an accident. The Lord himself sent me to tell you this, and this will be the proof of that for you. So that's Zechariah's time frame. Questions on that or comments? That's what's going to happen. Remember, he's wrapping this all up on the eighth night vision. Now, there's a final question. While picturing events in the days of Zechariah, how do the words of 615 also picture the works of New Testament believers? as they await the Lord's return. 6.15 starts with, those who are far away will come. How is this also a picture of Mount Olive? How is this also a picture of the New Testament? What do you think? How is this a picture of your experience? Those who are far away will come and help build the temple. No, this is the, these, are the, these are the rest of the world, the, the Gentiles and the whole world. We're building the church. So Dennis has latched on the fact, finally we found his Gentiles. <laughs> this is a, these are a reference to what we see. And by the way, the Gentiles Dennis is talking about are the people in this room, okay? Just so you know. All y'all are coming, and you're going to help build the temple of the Lord. God's predicting that through the vision to Zechariah. All of the temple will be built by the Lord himself, and we're going to see the growth of that temple in our lifetime. So we become part of this picture as the picture comes to a conclusion. God says it's connected to you. This is important. This isn't just history. This is your life that God's predicting will happen, and this is your experience as you live in the world right now. You become what God predicted would happen. Many would come from far away. That's you. And would help build the temple of the Lord. That's you. That's Sunday morning. That's every day. That's when you take that hope that God gives you and share it with the people around you. You're building the temple of the Lord working together to get that done by God's grace. That's the picture. And that's the end of the visions. Comments, questions, reactions. Wow. You know, as I said, I, I have not taught the visions, the night visions before. In all the Bible teaching I've done, taught the whole Bible, taught everything, never taught this. And never delved right into this. And for obvious reasons, this is not the simplest of things. But it's so related to the Revelation visions that it naturally drifted into that for me. But I, even at that, it truly surprised me how amazing these visions are, how they work together, how they're related one to another, and how systematically the God reveals his plan to the whole world, even way back when. This is 520 B.C., 500 years before Jesus came. This was the picture God revealed. Talked about the branches coming. Told them to put a crown in the temple, and you can all look at it every day and know the branch is coming. 500 years from now, he's going to show up. You talk about... Sometimes people ask what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Where'd that go? Who stole it? We don't know. Some conqueror, no doubt, one of the many nations. But this crown stayed in that temple. This was the replacement for that. They could look to that crown and see what's coming and be reminded that God is in their midst and he made a promise. 
Questions or comments before we bring this to a close? Stunned, I see. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I think I can speak for everybody in the class how we appreciate the time and effort to put in to this uh, study. We have fellow classmates here. I uh, really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you this. very much. It was real fun. I enjoyed it. Um, for me, oddly enough, it's just how much I learned as well by getting to share this with you. That's really what it's always about. The preacher, every time you read the Bible, you learn something you didn't see before. And I, I sure hope you find that out if you haven't already. I've, I've read the Bible more times than I know over the last 50 years. Read the whole Bible, taught the whole Bible for over 50 years. And yet I learn more now reading the Bible on a daily basis than I ever learned before. What happens at this stage, and I hope it happens for you as well, or it is happening, when you read the Bible at this stage, any passage that you read, 12 other passages are from, coming into your mind. 12 other places in the Bible are appearing together and say, look, they're related. They're all, that's what it means. And you suddenly see a connection you never saw before, and it suddenly deepens the feeling and the experience of the reading. And that never stops. The Bible's the only book like that. Um, if you read this book, it just grows and grows and grows as you're reading. And so Zechariah was another example for me, the night visions. It's another one of those things that I didn't really see clearly until I get a chance to study it with you. It's really a blessing. So I enjoyed it and I got a lot out of it and I hope you did as well. Let's close our time together with the Lord's blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. God bless your day. You have off next Wednesday. <laughs> so what's the next? Oh, I can find it on my calendar.